Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz at ClassicsToday.com, here to talk to you about Carmina Burana, Carl Orff's solitary masterpiece, even though he wrote a lot more music than that. Now, I've sung in it, I've played it, I've known it since I was in high school, and I think that all of us probably go through a series of stages in our relationship to Carmina Burana. First, there's fascination. You hear it and it's just cool and vibrant and vital and exciting and, and thrilling and percussive and rhythmic. And it's got all those great little tunes and they're folky and easy to remember. It's just terrific and you love it. Then of course you realize it's part of a trilogy and you hear the other two parts of the trilogy, Catuli Carmina and Il Triumfo di Aphrodite, and you realize they're not nearly as good. And that's kind of disappointing because, you know, you'd like to have more. But unfortunately, the others have their charms, of course, and some people, some people enjoy them. I mean, Cthulhu Carmen particularly is, is basically a purely choral work, and it's pretty wonderful. Then you probably heard Stravinsky's Les Nos, and you realize that Karl Orff made his entire career imitating Stravinsky's Les Nos. The Stravinsky is laid out for four pianos and percussion, just like Atuli Carmina, but the uh, piece is 20 minutes long and it's in Russian, and so you probably came to it later than Carmina Burana. Nonetheless, Stravinsky wrote his in about 1920, and Karl Orff did his in the mid 30s. So, uh, you know, who's kidding who? Karl Orff was not the most original genius out there. Then you find out that he was really a pretty serious collaborating Nazi, which is kind of depressing, but perhaps that's redeemed by his work in children's education and his Orff method for teaching music, which, you know, kind of redeemed him somewhat. And eventually you settle down to just enjoying the piece for what it is, a really entertaining piece of choral, choral writing for a big orchestra, um, it's almost never played the way it was intended. It's actually a ballet. Um, I've actually seen it staged that way at the uh, New York City Opera, and it's really quite fun and works very, very well when done as a ballet. But in any case, there are about a million performances of it, and I have a few criteria that I use to judge performances. Uh, obviously, rhythm is one of them. The choral singing is critically important. The soloists have important things to do also. But, you know, what really drives me crazy is in the first chorus, O Fortuna, you know, when, when it really gets hopping, there's a very, very important crashing tam-tam in the back. And right here, as you can see, is one of my own uh, symphonic tam-tams. This is actually a rather large one, larger than a lot of the ones in most orchestras. It's about 40 inches across. But there is never an excuse not to hear that tam-tam crashing away in the O Fortuna chorus. And if you don't, something is wrong. The conductor hasn't been paying attention. It's marked fortissimo. I mean, I'm not going to really give it too much of a whack. I'm just going to give it a little one here. See? I mean, that's barely a tap. And in a big orchestra, nothing is louder. So if you don't hear the tam-tam, something isn't going correctly. You have to. It's that simple. Now, in early performances of Carmina Burana, a lot of the percussion playing was terrible because German orchestras, particularly Central European orchestras, simply didn't have high quality instruments and the players themselves were not really all that adept at pieces that were that reliant on percussion. I mean, it's the same problem in early recordings of things like Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. And the percussion sections in these orchestras is just awful. The exception largely were French orchestras, which had usually ample percussion sections because of their theatrical work in, in the opera and, and, and composers willing to write for large percussion sections. And of course, American orchestras who had, you know, the American idiom and the jazz idiom and rock and roll and all these other things and British orchestras too, for that reason. But the Central European orchestras were very slow to pick up on decent percussion sections. So you really have to have quality percussion in order for Carmina Burana to make its best impression. And then superb choral singing. Now, for example, there's there's a chorus in the third part, Veni, Veni, Venias, you may recall. And it's for chorus and semi-chorus. So the semi-chorus only says one thing, Nazaza, basically. And you're supposed to hear it screaming Nazaza while the other chorus is running around. And if you don't, 
you don't hear the actual parts, and you often don't. Something isn't right. The conductor hasn't been paying attention. But that said, there have been many, many, many fine recordings of Carmina Burana, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the better ones. First, there's the one on my iPhone. That's this one. This is Donald Runnicles with the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra and Chorus, a great chorus trained by Robert Shaw, as you know, and a blockbuster of a performance recorded by Teller. The other great one is Herbert Blomstedt, San Francisco Symphony Orchestra and Chorus. Very, very musical, full of color and also some charm and grace where, where Orff allows you the opportunity, mostly in part three at the beginning. And then finally, this one, Eugen Jochum's. This was authorized by Carl Orff. Not that that means anything. I mean, composers are sometimes the worst judge of their own work. But in this case, you have Jochum who supported Orff all of his life and gave beautiful performances. And it's one of the few German performances that actually does justice to the percussion writing, probably because it's the chorus and orchestra of the Deutsche Oper Berlin. And so it's a theatrical orchestra that has the necessary chops to play very theatrical music. Now, if you're looking for all three, the trilogy, Triumphi, it was called, um, this is the one to get. This is Herbert Kegel with his Leipzig forces, Leipzig Radio Choir and uh, the Leipzig Radio Orchestra. Kegel was, was a wonderful conductor. This is not the most percussive of Orff performances, but my God, the choral singing is stunning. It's just amazing. Now, Franz Welser most did all three pieces, and so did Jochum. But I think, on balance, the Kegel is the best. The only problem with this is that it's been repackaged in this brown thing with its sort of fuzzy velvet and collects hair. It's, it's disgusting. But the performances are wonderful. So if you'll excuse the sound of the vacuum cleaner out in the hallway, where the super is doing the hallway to keep us all from catching coronavirus, that is my recommendation for Carmina Burana. You've got Jochum, you've got Blomstedt, you've got Runnicles, there was a great old one on RCA by Azawa. There's a really good one by Michael Tilson Thomas. Simon Rattle's latest one with the Berlin Philharmonic was very good. There are a lot of choices, but do enjoy it just for what it is and try not to think about too much else. It's not music that lends itself to profound meditation and depth. It's just supposed to be fun and exciting and colorful, and I think that's good enough. Thank you and take care.